tool. <laughs> I can't. Oh. oh, hold on. It's okay. She, she clicked start webinar, but we're not broadcasting yet. We're just recording now. It's okay. Jeez. Oh. So, so Denise, you see where I want you to handle these. Things. Okay. I will go ahead and do that. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead and stop sharing your screen and then I'll take over when it's time. Okay. How do I stop sharing? Oh, stop sharing. I see it. Okay. No, no I'm glad worries. you're a wizard this, you know. <laughs> well, you had a few, I had, I have a little bit of, we had time to practice. So no worries, Dr. Knopfel. <laughs> so my, we are recording right now. Yeah, it's okay. We're not broadcasting though, okay. but we will promptly at, um, so we're, yeah, nobody will be able to join the meeting until the <laughs> three o'clock time. It's just going to be a longer recording. That's okay though. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I just had a, a new experience this whole week. I'm a, I'm a lecturer, um, organizer, moderator, course director for American Academy Family Physicians, and all of our annual courses had to be had to be um, switched to virtual. So we did a live um, broadcast over the past three and a half days. <laughs> the last session was this morning. Wow! So it's like I'm exhausted. <laughs> I think the virtual takes a lot out of us. We're on, I'm on camera almost like eight to nine hours a day. It takes a lot out of you. I agree. With all the meetings that we're doing virtually and yeah. But much more than you'd think, but mm -hmm. I agree. So I'm not sure I'm going to do that next year though. <laughs> we'll see. Famous last words. I know you've heard that before. <laughs> Rebecca Janice is quite a uh, she's quite a reference for us for for our office whenever we need anything she's she's our go to person at UNM. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, and so Tim, I don't know if you know the backstory on that, uh, because that's that's uh, that's because you all uh, before your time you were the, you were our go to person for our echo clinics. We did uh, five years plus of. Um, uh, Echo Dementia Care Clinics and Alzheimer's Association was the partner. So that was really okay. It's payback. You guys, you guys were a great support for that whole yeah. endeavor. You know, and you know, um, Rebecca. You know, Project Echo is based out of here. It's founded. Here. I heard. I you know, I was I was um, chatting with Dr. Heather Snyder, who is one of my colleagues on the bedside team, and she was like, "Oh, that's an Echo site," and I was like. I knew that. I was very excited to hear um, that you you were all so involved with that. Yeah. Well, the truth be told is that we're the originator of that. Yep. So that's our that's probably one of well, at least in in healthcare that's probably one of our most famous things that we've done. <laughs> so it's a good yeah. thing, and I know we're expanding it too. We're trying to make it, use of it to yeah. reach as many physicians and clinicians as possible. Yeah. It's a great resource. And that was totally, the truth be told, that was totally out of desperation. We were having lots of young people coming to us with in-stage um, liver cirrhosis from the hepatitis C. Wow. And it's treatable, right? But yep. they couldn't they couldn't access um, treatment or diagnosis. So wow. out of desperation comes the desperate measures, and sometimes it works out really, really well. I didn't know that was, uh, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. Just putting some stuff in the chat so people know to how to join the meeting. Um, sometimes they have to refresh their page. So, how many people are you anticipating for this this meeting today? Well, it's hard to tell because what happened, what we found out, and, and this was a learning experience for us yesterday, is we have people that come in through the main site, and then sometimes they end up over. They put themselves in the Zoom site. So, mm -hmm. like. We had 74 people or so yesterday afternoon on the Zoom side, and I'm not sure we haven't seen the numbers yet from the main side yet. So it was kind of interesting. We got to put the numbers together. Okay. But I would guess I would guess we'll have at least 100 people here. So when I logged in, I went to like the conference website. Is that the main site or the Zoom site? Yeah. No, that's, that's the main site. Okay. So what happens is in the in the main site, if you, you go in and you say you want to get into the, to the video to this presentation, and it's there's a little fine line under the picture, and it says 
if you're having any problems or challenges type thing, hit this for the Zoom link. Uh, and we found out how many, a ton of people have done that for every, mm. so that, that's when we found out yesterday, and that's why Denise was helping me, that we actually have two chat sites. We have the Zoom chat site and the regular chat site. Oh, because that's <laughs> all I that saw. Yeah. When I closed my screen down, I was like, oh, there's about like 41 people on or something last night when I was doing yeah. it. And I saw the chat. I was like, how are they getting the questions? Because there's no questions. Like, I was very confused. <laughs> yeah, no, it was very confusing for us early on. It was like, wait a minute. We went through the training and everything else, but we didn't get told that, did we, Denise? Didn't. And so I was getting, you know, I was confused because I was like, wow, there's only like on some sessions, I was like, there's only like 15 people here, but I had 68 registered. So I started wondering if we were having technical issues. But what it, what I found out was, yeah, those people might be broadcasting, watching the broadcast on the event page and not in this meeting link. Uh, and, and my understanding is there would be nobody in these meeting links and only the broadcasting. So right, that was only going to be yes. Yeah, okay. but right now it's it's recording, so we but we can edit this part out. Yeah. But there's nobody in here now. They're not. Okay. It's not open um, until three o'clock. So. Um, well, you know, this this all fits under the category of you just click on everything until something happens. <laughs> That's it what I did. <laughs> I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm going to click on that. So that's how I got <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, gosh. So Denise at three o'clock, I don't have anything to hit this time. I, it's already hit. I just started at three o'clock. Just at three o'clock, just go ahead and we'll, we'll in a few um, minutes, we'll mute our video and our audio, and then you can go ahead and introduce Dr. Knofel yep. um, and Dr. Adamai. What we did last yesterday, yep. you know, I kind of had a few, so <laughs> of these meetings, <laughs> that is. <laughs> so, um, and then um, Dr. Knofel, you'll introduce Dr. Edelmeyer. Yes, um, I have my page here. Okay, yep. perfect. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm going to be interested to see what, what Rebecca says about the uh, the findings or the uh, uh, the advisory committee from the FDA mm -hmm. yesterday. Oh, don't ask me that. Anything. Don't ask me that in front of everybody. <laughs> okay, no, that's why I say I'm, I'm waiting to hear what you're going to say about yeah, that. Yeah, it's going to be, yeah, I'm going to try to, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just let it go. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll, we'll see. I might get pressed. Yeah, but you know, we all know that's not the end of it, so. Oh, yeah, and I think that's really the answer, so yeah. it's a step. We're still in, we're still in some phases here. Yeah, we just we just think of that as a group therapy session yesterday. <laughs> it was interesting. It was very interesting. That's what I was telling Tim before you jumped on. I'm like, the personalities on that phone line yesterday were very interesting. <laughs> Did Joanne get beat up at all on that or not? Did who? I'm sorry. Dr. Pike. Wasn't no, she? no. She just gave a very nice statement. Um, and so there was actually, I think, close to 17. Um, speakers that were invited to give a statement, three minute okay. statements each. So, gotcha. Well, the chat is already a little active. We've got two minutes. I'm showing two minutes out, but Tim, just check me. Yeah, I'm showing 258 right yeah. now, but um, just some hellos and, and stuff. So, it looks like everybody's hopping on. Um, They're not hopping on Zoom right now. So, that's good if we can keep them on the outside. Oh. They are. So I think oh, they are. now they are. I can see that now. Now all of a sudden it just jumped up. <laughs> so let's go ahead and um, mute our videos okay. and our mics and then Tim, take it away. Okay. So I'll let all three of you turn off. Dr. Knuffel, if you want to turn off your video. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. Okay, your video and your mic. I don't want to steal your thunder there, no, Tim. That's okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you've really enjoyed our uh, caregiver uh, conference this year. Um, this is our ending session for the caregiver conference, and it we have saved one of the best for the last, although I think we've had some great sessions throughout the last two days. And I'm Tim Sheehan. I'm the executive director of the Alzheimer Association New Mexico chapter. In our closing session, we're going to be talking about uh, 
some research data and what's going on in the Alzheimer's world right now. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Janice Knofel, um, who is a doctor um, with neurology. She's a neurology specialist, excuse me, with UNM Center for Memory and Aging and a great friend of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, she's our go-to person whenever we need help for this chapter. So um, we are very, very happy to have her on board and also have the UNM Health Sciences actually take care of this and be our sponsor for this research update. So Dr. Knobel, take it away. Thank you very much. Let me start my video. Hello, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm uh, excited to join in this conference. Sorry, I couldn't join earlier. Uh, I've been busy over here at the university and I'm gonna actually show you why I say that. Um, and how, how busy we really have been. Okay, may I start the um, slides, please? Yes, let me just go ahead and pull up my screen, Dr. Knofel, I'll be- No problem, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, hopefully um, everybody can see that. Um, was, yeah, um, so actually let's go back to the very beginning, if, if, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, we are very happy to be sponsoring uh, a portion of the uh, caregiver conference today. I, I miss ev seeing everybody in the exhibit hall and hopefully next year we'll be able to, uh, to get back together again. I'm very much looking forward to that. So uh, next slide, please, Denise, thank you. So I just wanted to kind of review the activities that we have going on. Um, at UNM. I know a number of you over the years have been over to see us and we're really excited about that. And I, I just have to tell you, I love so much our collabor collaboration and our consultation. Um, it's what drives me in my career, I have to tell you. Yeah, research is really important, but it's the, it's the clinical connection. It's the one-to-one -one personal connection that I, I myself really thrive on. So let me tell you a little bit um, for those of uh, you who do not know what we do over at the Center for Memory and Aging. Um, we, have, we are very active in our clinical services. Uh, we have neurologists, uh, we have nurse practitioners, nurses, medical assistants, and we have been doing both in-person and now virtual um, audio vi video consultations. That's what's really, um, I believe it has really expanded our reach and it's going to expand it further um, into the future. So I'm very, very excited. Um, and as we all know, during these challenging times, uh, we have to look for uh, uh, the promise and uh, the good things that come out of uh, such a difficult time that this country and this whole world is having. So what some of our plans are is that we are going to be recruiting two new faculty so that we have expanded clinical availability uh, in dementia care uh, for the entire state. We're very much looking forward to that. And for those of you who have joined us uh, for consultation over on um, our clinic space at uh, Clinical Neurosciences, we, we are right in the middle of where the hospital is. It's very busy there. Parking is very not so good. <laughs> so the good news is, I think you heard, some of you might've heard this from Dr. Rosenberg yesterday. We are getting a new building and it's going to be right on the hospital grounds. It's going to be a, it's going to be a two story building with a one floor for movement disorders. And then another floor is going to be for a center for memory and aging and also our senior health center which is our premier uh, primary care practice uh, for seniors um, in the Albuquerque and the Tri-County area. So we're really excited about that. Currently that project is out for bid, which means it's not, they're not breaking ground yet, but we are, we are getting there. And they tell us still that it will be completed by uh, the end of um, 2021. So that's, that's excellent. Over here on our right, you see some of our staff. You'll recognize Dr. Rosenberg in the middle. Myself, I'm on the far right. And John Adair is over uh, the shoulder, the um, right shoulder of Dr. Rosenberg in, in the back. So some of you have, have known us um, through our clinical work. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, let me just talk a little bit about research since that's really what this topic is going to be uh, about uh, for this, this session. So um, Dr. Rosenberg um, has been funded and has been doing research into uh, vascular illness and dementia for the better part of 30 years. Uh, talk about uh, Im improvements in progress that have been made over those 30 years is fantastic. So out of his groundbreaking work, uh, NIH found, um, funded us in 2016 uh, as part of a consortium to, to really focus on vascular dementia and what, what can be done. I know how, how can we detect it? How can we diagnose it? And of course, most importantly, how can we treat it? So the consortium itself is um, uh, seven uh, research centers uh, across the country, um, and we have been working together uh, to improve the diagnosis and also to develop new treatments. Um, and what we are, what we this has really um, happened. What has really occurred is that we are evolving into a long-term uh, research uh, project into the vascular impact on Alzheimer's disease. Now you may have you may have heard about vascular disease in the past. Obviously, you've heard about Alzheimer's disease, but there is another condition that's called mixed dementia, and that's a type of dementia that has contributions both from Alzheimer's and also from the vascular risks that we have. So um, we may not be able to totally impact Alzheimer's biology at this point, but let's take a look at what we can do. Uh, to impact the vascular factors. So we are currently in the fifth year of that big project. We have studied over uh, 100 patients and we're getting our methods down. We're practicing and refining our methods. We have done uh, multi-year neuropsychological testing. We do a complete um, neurological exam looking at balance and movements and certainly walking. Um, we do uh, extensive uh, research MRI imaging, and then we do analysis of the Alzheimer's disease proteins. Uh, some of them are in the blood, uh, some of them are in the spinal fluid, um, and we are making progress in separating out the two impacts, vascular and Alzheimer's. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So I wanted to show you some of the centers, um, a map of the centers of the um, Mark of VCID. Mark, you probably say, who's that, right? Well, Mark stands for markers. What kind of biomarkers can we get for vascular um, dementia? So we have us down there at, uh, in uh, New Mexico, over to uh, the west of us. We have uh, University of Southern California. We have the University of California, San um, Francisco and Davis. And then over to the East Coast, uh, we've got in the Chicago area, we've got Rush uh, Medical Center, we've got the University of Kentucky, Johns Hopkins, we have uh, Boston University, um, and um, also the coordinating center is up there at Harvard at the Massachusetts General Hospital. So this is our group of seven centers with one coordinating center. And um, um, we have just received word in the past two weeks that NIH is very pleased with the work the seven centers have, have done over the past five years, and they agree that we are going to be moving forward and continuing our work uh, rather than stopping it at the end of five years. So we're very pleased about that. Next slide, please. So that has taken us, if you will, to, uh, 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 has given us further opportunities. Let me put it that way. So um, some of you may know that we have been trying here at UNM to obtain uh, funding and designation as an actual Alzheimer's disease research center. And um, after trying, uh, we tried again, and then we got it on the second try. So we were just notified in August of this year that we have been designated for a three-year funding project uh, through National Institute of Health. So we're very excited about that. At first we were really excited and then we started to say, oh my God, how are we gonna do all this? So this is how we're going to do it. Um, aim one is to build up our own infrastructure and we hire new faculty. So I just talked about the new building to hire, to uh, house those three programs that's under construction almost. Um, 
And that was a project that was started already, but now we have um, uh, shown that we really, really need this new construction. And we are going to be recruiting uh, two new faculty members for Alzheimer's disease and clinical work. And I think it's really important for you to know it's not just for research, it's also for the clinical work. And that's where you come in, that we need, we need you to come to, um, to be assessed and to be treated. And then maybe uh, some of you will come over into the research as well. Aim two is to bring uh, our uh, American Indian population uh, into the Alzheimer's Center, into uh, the, the research arena, as well as into the uh, clinical. Um, we have uh, a mobile um, MRI, uh, which has been used by our partners at the, um, at the MIND Research Institute. Um, and they have been taking the, the MRI to various places. And uh, we have formed a coordination with them, a collaboration with them, uh, so that the MRI and neuropsychological testing and blood studies will be able to be done on site in the, um, in the Zuni and Acoma Pueblos. We know what a huge state New Mexico is and um, access uh, from the rural areas um, to uh, healthcare and research is very limited. So um, what did they say about the mountain in Mohammed, right? Uh, if, you can't bring, if you can't take the Mohammed to the mountain, we're gonna bring the mountain to Mohammed. So here we go, that's what we're going to do. Our third aim is the use of biomarkers to help determine what specific type of dementia does a person have. And so to that end, we are going to be measuring both the Alzheimer's disease proteins in the blood. And we're also going to be applying the advances in imaging uh, from our vascular studies uh, to the study of Alzheimer's. Now, you probably never really thought of imaging as a biomarker, but there are biomarkers with our advanced imaging techniques that we can um, really understand what is contributing to the underlying disease process. And I think I have one last slide. Um, and again, uh, this is the map of all of the um, Alzheimer's disease research centers. Um, the bright blue are the newest members. Um, so we can count our uh, Southwest neighbor, um, Las, um, uh, Nevada, as well as two uh, states in the Southern um, Southeast. So we're very happy to be part of this group and um, we look forward to expanding our work uh, not only with the research, but also with the clinical activities. So I will be available for uh, comments and questions at the end of the presentation. So I hope I haven't taken up too much time, but um, I wanted to introduce our main speaker and I'm very delighted to have met her. Her name is Rebecca Edelmeyer. She is uh, with the um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's Association and she is leading the efforts to accelerate um, scientific uh, agenda through the creation and delivery of ongoing research education. We know there's different types of education and research needs education as well. Um, Dr. Edelmeyer engages with more than 75 Alzheimer's Association chapters across the country, ens ens ensuring that staff and the public are aware of the importance of medical research and the association's crucial role in advancing research to improve the lives of individuals living with dementia and their care partners and families. Dr. Edelmeyer manages initiatives uniting researchers and clinicians with leaders of industry, the regulatory agencies, and the government on topics related to biomarker testing, new investigational treatments, and the use of digital health and biotech approaches for studying cognition. Dr. Edelmeyer has um, over 18 years of experience as a scientist and an educator. She spent more than six years as a pharmacologist in the neuroscience and immunology discovery divisions at Abbott and uh, AbbVie, where she was recognized as an, emergence, as an emerging scientific leader. As a senior scientist, she led a digital pathology team conducted a research and supported the development of clinical therapeutics and chronic inflammatory diseases of the nervous system and the skin. In many aspects, in many ways of thinking about it, the vascular 
uh, process in dementia is an inflammatory response. So we're going to rely upon Dr. Edelmeyer to help us as well. Uh, Dr. Edelmeyer has uh, lectured, published, and led collaborations in areas of neurodegenerative disease, neurophysiology, inflammatory skin pathology, and pain neurobiology. She completed her PhD in postdoctoral training in medical pharmacology with a focus on neuropharmacology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Dr. Edelmeyer holds a bachelor's degree in neuroscience from the University of Pittsburgh, where she also completed a National Institute of Mental Health Research Fellowship. I would say uh, Dr. Edelmeyer has a great deal of background and experience and leadership in research. And I welcome her today on listening uh, very much to what she will say. Uh, Dr. Ed Ed Edelmeyer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Knopel. And it's really exciting to be here with you today to hear more about all of the amazing work that's happening at the new exploratory ADRC in Albuquerque, and also to share some of the other types of research that are happening across the United States and really around the world right now that we think are going to really help advance and move the needle forward on better tools for early detection and diagnosis, new treatments, and even potentially new prevention strategies. So I thought today we would start off together really discussing the landscape of Alzheimer's and dementia science. Dr. Knofel did a, a wonderful job talking about something I think it's critical and that mixed dementia is very common. And I wanna lay out um, some of those details for you a little bit more. And then we'll get into some highlights around research focused on early detection and diagnosis. Some of the things that have been hitting the news waves recently. And then I'd like to talk a little bit more about the latest advances in clinical trials. That includes drug treatments, but also potentially what we would call lifestyle interventions or modifiable risk factor interventions and, and sort of round out the day from there. So let's just begin. You all probably have seen some of these figures before. This is, these come from the Alzheimer's Association Facts and Figures Report that's put out once a year. Now, there are more than 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's. We also know today that it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. But we also know that there's 16 million Americans providing unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias. And we know that there's critical training and education that's needed for healthcare providers to make sure that they are able to handle questions from patients as well as care caregivers coming into the clinic wondering what is happening um, if they're experiencing memory or, or thinking issues. How do we move forward with treatment? How do we move forward with care? So the Alzheimer's Association certainly is committed to making sure that we continue to build the infrastructure, not only for the next generation of clinicians who are going to be helping to care for all of the individuals that may be living with Alzheimer's or other dementia, but we're also really focused on making sure that we move the research forward. So let's talk a little bit more about dementia. It's probably one of the biggest questions that I get, most frequently asked questions really, is, is dementia and Alzheimer's the same thing? Well, when we really talk about the word dementia, we're really describing an umbrella term, which is used in a way to describe symptoms that are associated with cognitive impairment. And now this can include both cognitive, like memory and thinking, um, difficulties, but it can also include behavioral and psychological features such as agitation, um, sleep disturbances, even anxiety, depression. All of those things fall under the sort of behavioral and psychological symptoms as the umbrella term of dementia. What we know today is that Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of symptoms of dementia, meaning that it's defined in the brain by specific changes in biology. We've probably heard about the amyloid beta protein, the plaques and the tangles made up of the tau protein and the nerve cell death that occurs in the brain. And that causes shrinkage to areas of the brain tissue that are really important for memory, thinking, and even your personality and sometimes language. But vascular disease is another common cause of dementia as Dr. Knopel mentioned. Vascular disease can be many things. It could be sort of a leaky blood vessels in the brain, allowing blood to pass out into that blood tissue that really is putting it in a place where it shouldn't be, causing damage to 
the nervous tissue that surrounds those vessels. It could be a blockage of blood vessels in the brain. Those are things that you've seen before. Um, uh, probably you've been heard it called as a stroke. You, you've also probably heard of things like a brain hemorrhaging, micro hemorrhages. That's a bleeding again outside of those blood vessels in ways that it shouldn't be. And that can really damage the brain tissue. And so one of the things that we also see is that vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease are very commonly combined, attributing to much of the case, many of the cases of what we would call mixed dementia, meaning the individual is living with brain changes or brain pathology that are falling into these two different categories. Many individuals also have other types of brain changes. Um, they may be living with changes associated with dementia with Lewy bodies. This is a change in a protein called alpha-synuclein that builds up in the brain. Now, alpha-synuclein tends to build up in areas of the brain that are not only responsible for memory and thinking and cognition, but potentially also areas that are important for motor movement. And this is where you see some things related to Parkinson's dementia or even dementia with Lewy bodies. And frontotemporal dementia is another common cause identified by very specific changes in the brain. So as though mixed dementia is very prevalent, we know that there are some causes of cognitive decline that are reversible and not truly um, uh, neurodegenerative disease or dementia. So it's always really critical that you make sure that if you have any memory or memory concerns or any concerns about your cognition that you really do seek out some advice from a physician so that we can rule out whether or not we can treat that the um, cognitive impairment that you have and to really try to accurately diagnose the cause of those symptoms that you're experiencing. We know today that cognitive impairment really occurs across this continuum. It's sometimes difficult to say whether some individual falls into a very particular category. That's why very thorough cognitive evaluations are required to try to truly understand sort of the cognitive impairment, impairment continuum that you might be living in. Um, we all um, experience, uh, cog we're all cognitively unimpaired to begin with, but we may move through different phases. Uh, mild cognitive impairment or MCI is one of those phases that can be described as impairment that does not interfere with activities of daily living. But if someone is to progress into mild, moderate, or severe dementia, that means that they're going to be experiencing impairment of two or more cognitive functions that interfere with those activities of daily living. Now we know that MCI is a known risk factor for dementia, but not everyone who's experiencing MCI will go on to develop dementia. But everyone who experiences dementia has passed through some of these initial stages, these initial changes that are occurring. And so we really believe today that we need to be trying to address the causes of dementia at the earliest phases. And if we can prevent new cases of mild cognitive impairment, whether that be due to Alzheimer's disease changes or other types of dementia pathology, you could likely prevent new cases of dementia. And we'll talk a little bit more about why um, researchers think this. But I do want to assure you that the Alzheimer's Association is again really trying to push the research forward to advance it on every front. We're really leading the research community throughout a number of ways. We are the largest nonprofit funder of research in the world. We also convene the largest um, a conference and connections uh, for scientists through our Alzheimer's Association International Conference every year. We saw 33,000 people attend our virtual conference in July this year. It was just a fantastic way to make sure that research updates are being communicated across the field and discussed in the way that they should be. And we continue to advocate for innovative research on all fronts. We have seen over the past four to five years that we've quadrupled the NIH funding for Alzheimer's and related dementia research. Now this is really critical because this increased funding really goes back out into the research centers like you heard today in New Mexico. And those research dollars are so critical that they continue to help to drive innovative research forward and to really bring new people to the field to make sure that we're continuing to provide opportunities for that research to be conducted. One of the ways that that increased funding helps is that it drives new innovative centers, like you just heard from Dr. Knopfel. This exploratory Alzheimer's disease center is really exciting for your region. And this increased funding really allowed for the expansion of the ADRC network to four new exploratory sites this year. 
um, these exploratory ADRCs are really designed to expand and diversify research and education opportunities to new areas of the country, to new populations of the country, and to new approaches to research. And so really exciting to see that this is happening in your region. And just we look forward to some of the results and all of the work that's going to be coming out of this new center. As I mentioned, we are the largest nonprofit funder of research in the world. And this um, over $208 million right now are active in 590 projects in 31 countries. And we've been connecting with all of them, even in these challenging times that we're experiencing through the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that research must press on. We've been able to connect with those researchers, find out any challenges that they're having in, in trying to complete any of those research projects and really offering our support, help, and even additional funding if necessary to make sure that they don't lose momentum. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the research that we see happening across the field that you may be even seeing in the news. So if you have any questions, please, consider putting them in your chat feature because we will have some time at the end of the meeting um, to, to get to some of those questions for you. I think I started, I wanted to start really talking about biomarkers and Dr. Knofel brought this up as one of the things that are gonna be really critical for moving research forward, really aiding in better detection and diagnosis of individuals that are living with cognitive impairment. And as she mentioned, imaging, is actually a biomarker. It was one of the first ways that we were able to look inside the brain of someone that's living with Alzheimer's disease to actually help clinicians diagnose that they had those um, amyloid plaques in the brain. And that's one of the hallmark changes that are occurring in, in Alzheimer's. And there's many other imaging markers that are being developed today to aid in differential diagnosis of individuals that are coming into the clinic with cognitive impairment complaints but we're needing to continue to develop other types of biomarkers. Imaging is not accessible to everyone and it's still not covered by um, insurance. We need to make sure that we're continuing to develop accessible, not invasive, cost-effective, and even scalable biomarkers that can be used. You've probably heard of other types of biomarkers even for other diseases, like think about heart disease. We use cholesterol today and we can measure that in a blood test to know whether or not you're at risk for developing heart disease or cardiovascular issues. But we need those same types of tests for Alzheimer's and other dementias. And we've been making great progress in the biofluid space. We are looking at specific biofluids like our cerebral spinal fluid, which is that sort of clear nutritive fluid that bathes your spinal cord and brain and blood. And they're learning more and more that there are changes that happen in your blood and cerebral spinal fluid that are happening 10 to 20 years before anyone is even showing signs of cognitive impairment. So these changes are going to be critical in the future for, again, a clinicians to be able to help with diagnosis at the earliest stages. And as we continue to validate and do more research into the different types of biofluid biomarkers, we may soon have tests that are more accessible and cost-effective and really aid in the diagnosis process. We've even seen more emerging mark markers being developed. The retinal imaging is something that's very new and we're really looking into ways that maybe using the eye as a way for us to better understand what's happening in the brain could be a viable path forward for early detection of Alzheimer's or maybe even other types of dementia like vascular dementia. And genetics are really a hot topic of research right now trying to truly understand who is at risk and what drives their risk through genetics and other types of modifiable risk factors will be critical. Let's touch a little bit more on imaging. I wanna remind you of a study that took place over the past few years called the IDEAS study. This is, the study was called Imaging Dementia Evidence for Amyloid Scanning. Now this was a, the largest, one of the largest clinical trials ever to be conducted in Alzheimer's disease. And it allowed for over 18,000 Medicare beneficiaries to be scanned with an amyloid PET scan, looking for that amyloid plaque in the brain. And the goal of this study was to help provide the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid a better understanding on whether or not these types of amyloid PET scans would actually be valuable to physicians and patients to help with care management and also ma management of major medical outcomes. And we were looking to see what the impact of the scan results would be. Did you have amyloid in your brain or did you not? Because you were going to be a part of this study if you had mild cognitive impairment 
or dementia of an uncertain cause and you did not yet know what was causing that impairment. So if you had amyloid in your brain, there was a possibility then that you might be suffering from uh, Alzheimer's. And so we learned from the AIM-1 of this clinical trial, so far that's been published, that two thirds of the participants who had an amyloid PET scan actually had a change in their diagnosis and or care management as a result of the PET scan results. If they had amyloid in their brain, that meant that the physician was able to potentially prescribe new medications, put better care planning in place. If they didn't have amyloid in their brain, that meant that they needed to dig a little bit deeper into the source of the cause of their cognitive impairment. So we have more time to tell on exactly what the results will be for AIM-2 at this time, but we hope that that will be published rather soon. But we're getting, um, we're moving forward with an additional study called New Ideas. Now, this is the next phase of this research. The goal for this is that we, again, continue to provide more evidence around how these types of imaging biomarkers will improve the precision in amyloid PET coverage and patient care. We want to make sure that this type of information is going to be helpful for all populations. And so this particular study called New Ideas is aimed at recruiting a diverse cohort of, of 7,000 Medicare beneficiaries. At least 2,000 of those individuals need to be Black or African American, and 2,000 need to be Hispanic or Latin American. They can have early onset, meaning younger onset, or late onset dementia. They could have typical or atypical clinical presentations of Alzheimer's. And we are also going to be setting up a biorepository to collect blood from these individuals and allow that to be used to look across this very rich resource of, of imaging data, as well as blood sample data to really look at the correlations between those measurements. What's really exciting about this study is it's just starting to launch. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid actually approved the launch of this study, the proposal, um, in April, and we anticipate that it will start enrolling soon. Um, we will hopefully see this getting up and running in over 4, 400 sites across the country, and we anticipate it being about a three-year enrollment. So your site, um, your ADRC, may actually be one of those clinical trial sites. Another marker I want to bridge back to is the blood biomarkers. As you, as you heard, there's been a lot of progress being made in this particular area. And our Alzheimer's Association International Conference this year, we actually saw that research is suggesting that a new form of tau called phosphotau-217, a very specific form, when it's measured in the blood, it's highly accurate, even more highly accurate than other tau species that we see in the blood. And that this is able to allow researchers to differentiate between Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia. And while this is still research in the early stages, it's not yet in the clinic, um, but these blood tests would be certainly easier to administer and they might be more accessible than the current methods of evaluating Alzheimer's and would really be helpful in aiding in that diagnostic process. So more to tell on blood biomarkers, but we're really seeing a lot of uh, remarkable progress in blood biomarkers. If you asked me just five years ago, I would have told you that's crazy. We would never have blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's or other dementias, but we're getting closer and closer every day. So let's talk a little bit more about therapeutic development. We know that it takes time to develop new therapies where they start in the laboratory phase in cells in a dish, but then they move into human clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. And as you progress through these phases, they increase in the number of clinical trial participants, they increase in the length of time that they take, and they increase in the complexity of the, the outcomes from the trial that are needed to help develop a better understanding of both the safety and effectiveness of the therapeutics themselves. We know today that there are many drugs in the clinical trial pipeline just for Alzheimer's disease. So this is just a snapshot of what's being done in dementia research right now for Alzheimer's. We know that there's over 121 unique therapies being tested in 136 clinical trials today. We know that many of those treatments that are being tested in clinical trials are mostly to slow down the disease progression, about over 80% of them. But we also know that about 10% are aimed at improving memory, 10% are aimed at improving behaviors or psychological features. 
So we also know that many of the drugs in this pipeline are being repurposed. And that means that they're being brought in from other therapeutic areas, maybe cancer, maybe cardiovascular disease. And they're being tested in an Alzheimer's population because the therapeutics may have effectiveness based on the mechanism of biological action in the brain. So very exciting to see that this clinical trial pipeline continues to grow, it continues to diversify every day. But one of the things that I think is most critical to understand is that the total number of participants required for these currently recruiting trials is over 30,000 people to bring them to their completion. That's one of the biggest hurdles for moving new therapeutics forward is getting people to participate in clinical trials. And I would tell you today, if you are interested in being a part of the solution and interested in being a part of research, consider joining a clinical trial. And we can help you do this. The Alzheimer's Association actually has a free clinical trials matching service called Trial Match. And there's over 350,000 people using this matching service. There's over 300 clinical trials that are related to Alzheimer's and dementia that are taking place in over 500 clinical trial sites around the country. So if you're interested in getting involved in research, consider going to alz.org slash trial match. And that could potentially connect you to a number of clinical trials, even there in your area in New Mexico that are taking place. And you don't have to have cognitive impairment to be a part of these trials. They're also always looking for healthy volunteers. Maybe you'll be asked to help with testing a new blood test or even some type of cognitive training uh, digital technologies. There's so many different ways to get involved. So please consider uh, getting involved in a clinical trial today. So let's touch on a few of the clinical trials that are happening um, that we're really following quite closely. Um, a few drugs that are moving through the FDA regulatory review process today. You've probably heard about a drug called aducanumab, and you've maybe heard about a drug called pimavanserin or nuplazid. Now, these are two different drugs. One is aimed at changing the disease progression uh, related to Alzheimer's disease, that's aducanumab. The other, nuplazid, is aimed at treating one of the symptoms of, of dementia, which is dementia-related psychosis associated with both the hallucinations and delusions associated with psychosis. So let's talk about those two specifically. Uh, so for aducanumab, this is a drug that's made by a company called Biogen and actually Asai. Uh, aducanumab is an anti-amyloid therapy, meaning its true target is to go after those amyloid plaques in the brain and, and help them from not building up in the brain and the brain tissue. It has been tested in a trial population of individuals that are living with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's and mild Alzheimer's dementia. We heard a few years ago that this trial was actually halted back in March of 2019. We heard also surprising announcements from Biogen in October of 2019 and then more data reported in December of 2019 that this drug may have some promise. There was some data that was shown that there was a reduction in clinical decline. There, they actually saw benefits or effects on cognition and function, and they saw a reduction in those amyloid and tau biomarkers in the brain. Now this actually led Biogen to submit an application to the FDA for the FDA to review all of the data associated with aducanumab to really truly understand what the safety and efficacy or effectiveness of this drug would be in individuals living with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's and mild Alzheimer's dementia. We heard back in the summer that the FDA agreed to review this application. We also heard just yesterday that they held an advisory board committee meeting, meaning they brought in experts who had nothing to do with the trial to really give the FDA some advice and their opinions on what they thought about the safety and effectiveness of aducanumab. And right now we're waiting to see the full FDA review of all of the data and what their decision will be on this particular medication. And that is anticipated in March of 2021, or it could come before this. So there is still some time to wait, but we do hope to hear a decision soon at some time. So let's talk a little bit more about medicines focused on behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. This drug, Pimavanserin, is really aimed at dementia-related psychosis. And why they're using this sort of broad term is that this includes, they, in the clinical trials, they included individuals that had Alzheimer's, Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. 
this drug actually has the potential to be the first FDA approved psychosis drug tested in a dementia population. We don't know yet what the FDA will say about the safety and effectiveness of pemavanserin, but they did decide to review this drug and it's currently in the review process now. And we expect in it a decision about pemavanserin in April of 2021. Now this again is aimed really at treating the hallucinations and delusions associated with dementia related psychosis. But here's an example of a medication that could potentially be useful for people that have dementia, but of many different causes. So again, we're seeing a lot of different types of drugs and treatment options moving through the clinical trial pipeline today. So I know I'm running a little bit long here, but I hope you can stick around to hear a little bit more about understanding risk. And we know that there are many things that impact our risk. Age for, is one of the biggest ones. Genetics, your race and ethnicity also impact your risk. But we also know that modifiable risk factors like cardiovascular health, as Dr. Knofel mentioned, things that contribute to that, like your diet, your physical activity, and even sleep, your education, your environmental and other lifestyle factors may contribute to your risk. It's truly important that we understand dementia risk from all angles because it may not be the same for every individual of every population. And the only way that we'll know how to treat Alzheimer's and dementia and other dementias in the future is that we truly are understanding of the biology that's being driven by the risk. So here's, for example, a study that happened uh, that was reported out at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. We need to better understand how genes impact our risk. And from this particular research, we know that Hispanics, for example, are 1.5 times more likely to develop dementia than non-Hispanic whites. But we also know from research that the APOE E4 gene is the strongest known predictor of Alzheimer's risk for white European descended populations. But according to this new research, this gene may seem to be a less of an accurate predictor of risk for some Latin American populations and even may differ among Hispanics and Latin Americans of various origins. So what this research is really suggesting is that testing positive for APOE E4 may not actually mean the same risk for any population and any racial or ethnic group. So we need to continue to drive our understanding about genetics and how it really uh, impacts risk for all individuals. Here's another example of risk. We know very little at this time about what happen, it happens in your early life and how that may drive risk for developing late life dementia. But more and more research through epidemiological studies and observational studies are helping us to understand that there may be things across our life course that are really going to be impacting us as we're aging. This particular study looked at BMI, you're familiar with this, the body mass index. And it actually found that higher body mass index between the ages of 20 and 49 years old may be associated with higher late life dementia risk. We're learning more and more about risk. We know from the Lancet's Commission on uh, Dementia, which they put out every few years, that they believe that about 40% of global dementia may be preventable. Now that's, that's an amazing factor when you think about it. But getting back to what Dr. Knofel mentioned earlier is that things that contribute to vascular disease may actually be um, things that we can change today if we have access to ways to improve some of our habits and daily habits across our life course. And this is things like exercise, education, uh, cognitive training, not smoking, reducing obesity. And this year they even added a few more factors related to traumatic brain injury and a few other things. So it's really important that we continue to better understand what's driving risk and again, focus our efforts on then how do we use that to drive research forward in terms of finding community-based programs that are going to be effective in all populations. So I just wanted to drive forward here again, a lot of the research that we have around risk is using what we would call observational studies, meaning we're looking at large data sets, large healthcare data sets that are part of electronic medical healthcare records or through epidemiological research. That's really helping us understand what factors increase or decrease our risk for dementia. But we have to use that information and help it to design, to help us to design interventional studies, meaning we have to understand what impacts risk and then show 
in an actual clinical trial that reversing those risk factors will drive risk reduction. And here's a couple examples of things that have been done today um, that really are helping us better understand risk. So this particular study called the SPRINT Mind Study was study really helps us understand more information about cardiovascular disease risk factors and our, redu and our um, risk for developing mild cognitive impairment or dementia. This was the first study of its kind to demonstrate the reduction of new cases of cognitive impairment just by aggressively treating blood pressure alone. This study looked at intensive treatment of blood pressure, meaning you're bringing blood pressure to about 120 systolic, and it showed that you could dramatically reduce risk for MCI, risk for dementia, and also a combined risk of MCI and dementia. Now, the risk for dementia was not significant in this particular trial, so we needed to follow up with those individuals for a little bit longer. There's actually a study called the Sprint Mind 2 study that's now funded by the Alzheimer's Association and the National Institute on Aging that's following participants for an additional two years that were part of this initial trial to better understand the impact of blood pressure on dementia risk. Now, this is really important because there are things that we could be doing today regarding your risk for MCI and maybe even dementia, especially regarding cardiovascular disease factors. And it really is an immediate opportunity for us to look at the potential of life-changing impact that we could have on our dementia uh, risk and also our brain health in the light, long term. But there are other types of studies that are out there that are looking at risk reduction through a multi-domain approach. And the Alzheimer's Association is leading the U.S. Pointer Study, which is the U.S. study to protect brain health through lifestyle intervention to reduce risk. Now, this study is actually modeled after a, one of the first studies of its kind to take place in Finland, where they found that a multi-domain intervention allowed for a decreased risk in that particular aging population. Now, both the U.S. Pointer study is modeled off of the FINGER trial, which is a trial that happened in Finland. Now, this is really looking at two different types of lifestyle interventions, a self-guided approach versus a structured lifestyle intervention. So these two interventions differ in format, expectations, and accountability. But this clinical trial is really looking not at drugs, but a way of endorsing physical activity, better management of nutrition, intellectual engagement, as well as health coaching as part of the ways that we will look at individuals who are living at risk of developing cognitive impairment or dementia. They might have a family history, of Alzheimer's or other types of dementia in their family. They also will probably be living a lifestyle that has a little room for improvement, meaning they might be sedentary or they might actually not be eating a heart healthy diet. So these individuals will be looking at uh, taking part in this trial and really incorporating these four factors into their intervention. They will be measuring their cognition over time, but we will also be looking at other things the National Institute on Aging is supporting ancillary studies where we'll be getting neuroimaging data from a subset of the participants. There's actually a sleep study called the Pointer Z study to look at how the intervention actually impacts your sleep. And looking at the gut microbiome, how does changes in your nutrition, your physical activity affect your gut? And in the end, is that also helping to lead us to a better understanding of how that impacts your brain over time? and a neurovascular study. Again, very critical for us to truly understand how these types of modifiable lifestyle interaction, interventions could impact our overall vascular health. So this will be a critical and rich resource of data once this clinical trial is completed. It truly is a landmark study and it's taking place in five sites uh, in over 2000 participants. There's about 400 participants being recruited per site. And looking at those two interventions and these individuals will take part in this study for at least two years. Now we have nearly 400 individuals already enrolled in the trial and randomized to either the self-guided or structured intervention. And the goal of this trial really is to show that if the intervention proves effective, this study will lead the way to the development of an accessible and sustainable community-based program for prevention. So it's a really exciting time in research we really think that we can change the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. And that might not only be through drugs, but also through these types of risk reduction strategies, through modifiable lifestyle risk reduction. If we can develop a treatment by 2025 that delays the onset of Alzheimer's by just five years, 
we really expect that that will prevent about 5.7 million people from developing Alzheimer's by the year 2050. And that could have a huge impact on our society and our families. So in summary, I really hope that you truly leave here today and leave this conference knowing that the Alzheimer's Association is a global leader for Alzheimer's and dementia science. We will continue to move this needle forward every day for you and your families. It's really an exciting time in research. There's new tools for detection and diagnosis that we've never had before. It's really a new era for the field. There's a growing diversity of therapies under investigation, and there's also new resources and strategies, as you heard today from Dr. Knofel and myself about promoting diverse participation in research. And we really do believe that a future therapy for Alzheimer's and other dementia will probably include drugs as well as modifiable risk factor interventions. There is hope in research, and I hope that you will continue to stick it out with us and make sure that you stay educated, stay curious about research, and stay involved. Thank you so much for listening today, and I'm happy to turn it back over to our moderators so that we can hopefully still have some time to answer your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Edemayo. We do have some questions in the chat, and we do have some time to do that, so Excellent. thank you. Um, we have a question that uh, for Dr. Knofel, actually, um, that is um, any idea how long the blood biomarker test will be used in the general population? That's a good, that's a great question, actually. Um, and uh, Dr. Edelmeyer knows this as well, that there are more, uh, there are, there are coming advances um, in the equipment uh, that is uh, used to analyze the uh, fragments of the proteins in uh, the blood. Um, it may well, so, so what, what we're currently doing now is that we actually are going to be acquiring one of these um, uh, very complicated uh, uh, testing machines, equipment, um, and we are going to be using it on research first. Um, and then I think probably, if I had to estimate, I think it would probably be within maybe two years that it will be available. It's it's not tomorrow, but it's pretty much around the corner. So um, we're really excited about this. There still needs to be some more validation studies done, but um, it, it, it could be here sooner than we think. I, I do not have a timeline for you, however. Good question. Yeah, and I would okay. echo what Dr. Knopel just said. I think it's a little hard to give a, a full timeline right now. We are seeing really remarkable progress it, with, with a number of diagnostic companies. I know Quanterix is one of them. I think that they're testing that, that technology at um, the ADRC there. But there are a number of companies that are really in a race right now to continue to standardize and validate those blood tests because the goal is, is to make sure that they're as predictable and reliable as possible. And at this time, the FDA has not actually approved any single blood test. Um, much of them are still being used for research purposes, um, so that they're not approved as a diagnostic for Alzheimer's. There's no single test at this time that can prove or diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And that's why, again, um, many times that if you are seeing these types of tests um, in the clinic, that is because they're being used for research purposes or the, or the clinician really does have expertise in that area in using these types of tools as a way to help with the aiding in the diagnostic, diagnostic process. Great, thank you. We also have a question if we can briefly cover, why is it important to know the specific type of dementia a person has? Well, I will, I will address that from the clinical standpoint. Um, if, we, if we know um, exactly what is contributing uh, to the cognitive state, then we can tailor make and recommend um, some specific um, interventions. And uh, Dr. Edelmeyer gave a great explanation for why we under, need to understand about the vascular risks, because the vascular risks are, I believe, at this point, much more amenable to interventions than necessarily the Alzheimer um, biology. So, um, for instance, uh, blood pressure control, uh, control of diabetes, um, stopping smoking is the number one expedient uh, risk factor that we can reduce. Um, you know, exercise. Uh, let me just ask the audience: Has any physician ever told you did not exercise? Right? 
Everybody should be exercising more because that reduces our vascular risk as well. So that, that's why it's important at this point to understand what is contributing to the cognitive decline. In the future, as we have kind of discussed today, there may be a more specific medication specifically for a vascul the vascular process versus the coming medications that would in interrupt and impact the Alzheimer um, process. So that, that's why I, th I think it is important at this point. Great, yep. thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Edamaria. Yeah, I think that mostly covers it. I mean, I think that that's really where um, at least drug developers are also focused too, is that many times drugs are really aimed at a very specific mechanism of biology in the brain. So we know Alzheimer's is complex. And, and like uh, Dr. Knofel said, it's likely that you will be treated in the future with multiple medications in addition to some of these modifiable things like exercise that we're asking everyone to be doing. But that's kind of like how we treat heart disease today. So that's no different. We treat that with exercise, with better management of diet, but we also have blood pressure medicines and cholesterol medicines, right? They target two different things in the body. So it's likely we'll see the same thing for, for all dementia. Agreed. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question in our Zoom chat um, that I wanna address. It says, what medication can you use now before some of the ones that you discussed today in your presentation, um, before that is released in April, 2021? My mom fits that description. Right, so I think that's a question about, and I want Dr. Knofel to also weigh in on this, but this is a question about Pimavanserin. Yes. And this is about um, looking at treating the, what they call psychosis. And sometimes it's more easily to understand is uh, hallucinations and delusions, which is common in certain types of dementia and not so common in, in other types of dementia. So I think that if um, the individual is having those uh, symptoms, it's certainly something to talk to the physician about. But I would say that there are a number of medications that are being used today. Um, I would say in not such a safe way because there have been, there are psychosis medicines that are available for the general population, but they were never tested originally in the dementia population. And they actually were found to increase death in individuals that had dementia. So there's what they call a black box warning around those medicines now, because until they're tested in the dementia population to prove that they're safe, but also effective, they're not recommended as a first line therapy. So again, this would be the first medicine that actually has been tested in a dementia population and it will be up to the FDA to show whether it's actually safe enough to deliver. Um, but then I think in terms of what can be given now, I wanna pass it back to Dr. Knopel because I think that first line therapy is certainly always more of a behavioral approach before you, stick, before you start drugs and medications. But I, I think that you know this is something I'd like her to answer. Wonderful. I'll be happy to answer that. Um, so, so when a person undergoes their initial evaluation uh, for cognitive decline, we look at a number of risks, risks that can be actually actively um, currently addressed. So such things as sleep disturbances, like um, sleep apnea. Um, sometimes the medications we take are acting directly against our our memories, the formation of our memories, uh, depending upon what, what uh, chemical systems are involved. Um, and um, the other FDA approved medications for the most part are what we call for symptoms. So it doesn't uh, address the actual uh, underlying biological process. It just uh, tries to moderate the symptoms that are caused or that are precipitated by that underlying pathology. And those are the ones that we well know, um, like, um, like Aricept, like Razadine, Exelon, um, and Namenda. Those are the four that are currently FDA approved, but they don't reverse. They might temporarily shore up some of those symptoms, but they do not reverse the underlying um, biology unfortunately. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so for time's sake, I'm gonna uh, pick a couple more questions. My apologies if we if we didn't get to get to your question today. Um, one question is my brother has Down syndrome. Sorry, 
my brother has Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. My mother also has Alzheimer's. They are older, 58 and 85 respectively. Really low blood pressure runs in my family and they both have low blood pressure. Is blood pressure the only relative, is only relative if it's high? Dr. Knofel, would you want to take that one? I'm not sure I would actually know the answer. Sure, no problem. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously the blood pressure is very important to us continuing to breathe and move, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and too, too low of a, of a blood pressure can result in things like uh, dizziness and fainting, um, uh, loss of consciousness. Um, so yes, it is important to shore up that, um, that blood pressure as, as best we can to get it into the range where we need it to be. Too high, too too high is bad, and too low is bad. Um, in general, um, some people who are in very very good shape um, can tolerate. In fact, they their 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 good physical condition, uh, you know, generates a very low pulse and a very low blood pressure. But most of us do not fit into that category. So um, I would say, you know, if there are any symptoms from a low blood pressure that they, they definitely need to be uh, treated for that. Great, thank you. I wanna thank both of you. This has been a tremendous session. Dr. Edelmeyer for coming in to, to speak to us today. And we have an incredible research team at our home office in Chicago. I mean, they're all fantastic and we really appreciate your time. And Dr. Knoffel, you're always there for us, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much for your time today yeah. too. Both of you, this is a great way to wrap up our day. And uh, thank you very much. And I think we got all the questions just about, but we are running out of time. So um, we can follow up on any of the others later on. But thank you so much and everybody have a great day. And remember the exhibit hall is open for just a few more minutes and then the conference will end. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you, it's my pleasure.